page. All right, so today we're going to follow up on our discussion from um, uh, last Thursday about Poisson sources of uh, variance uh, and count data and elaborate a bit more on how it impacts the way we think about RNA-seq. So we're going to think about, we're going to really dive into sources of technical noise in RNA-seq data, both from Poisson technical noise and some other technical variation that, that arises as a function of all the stuff that we do to RNA before we, we actually sequencing, sequence it and align it to a transcriptome or a reference genome and count things to, to make inferences about the underlying biology. So uh, I want to start, let me, let me share my screen here. I want to start by acknowledging uh, a friend of mine, if I can figure out how to launch my screen here. Hopefully you can see my slides. Uh, so first off, uh, we're, we're, this is going to be purely lecture today. We're not going to be in R or on the command line. Um, so you can kick back, pick, pick, uh, put your feet up, ask questions along the way. All right, so this, this entire lecture is motivated by a really phenomenal blog post from uh, seemingly forever ago, might even be a decade ago now. Uh, by a, fr a friend of mine named Michelle Busby. Michelle and I were graduate students together, and her thesis work was on the emerging field of RNA-seq. Um, it was pretty early on after the development of the Illumina sequencing technology that um, people started to play with the conversion of RNA to cDNA and putting that cDNA into a sequencer and, and counting gene expression to you know, understand like, you know, everything from gene expression of, of genes and treated versus untreated conditions to, you know, what's going on in the cancer genome. And what Michelle really caught on to quite early is the, the really special mathematical and statistical considerations that are relevant to RNA-seq. Now, what preceded RNA-seq was microarrays. And many of you might be familiar with this, but essentially one of the big advances from the reference genome, having a human reference genome or a mouse reference genome is we knew a sequence. And so with that sequence, once we know where the coding, uh, coding genes are, you can design oligonucleotides um, that can be used as bait to target um, RNAs or cDNAs onto an array. And if you label one condition with, say, um, a green fluorescent label and another condition with a, a red, you could look at the relative intensity of green versus red in the two conditions to see, to identify genes that might be underexpressed or overexpressed. And the reason I take you through that history is that there was a tremendous amount of innovation um, in statistical methods, visualization methods that came out of microarray sequencing, because as soon as that technology came out, you know, it's sort of like the early days of RNA-seq, there were thousands, liter probably literally thousands of papers in the first couple of years talking about results that were found from mic microarray expression experiments. Um, but then there was sort of this moment of, or maybe this couple of years of, uh, wait a second, do we really believe that given all this, um, the statistical considerations that come into play with microarrays? And I think Michelle's work and some others around her time were, was a bit of ahead of its time. She was already thinking about the relevance of replicates and both technical and biological variation and how that affects um, interpretation. And this is especially important because now and especially then, RNA-seq was very expensive. So replicates well intuitive that you should do replicates there was you know often a push to let's do this experiment as cheaply as possible and she sort of this blog post is about the buyer beware considerations of doing things as cheaply as possible and get, she gives some really helpful guidance about how best to design an rna seq experiment in order to minimize noise thereby maximizing the biological signal that comes out of the experiment 
and, and therefore leading to better conclusions. Right, um, so this, this lecture is sort of the highlights of this blog post. If you're doing RNA-seq at all, or if you're, even if you're not doing it now, but doing it later, come back to this slide and go to this blog post down at the bottom. I encourage you all, all of you to read this blog post. It's probably a half hour of your life, um, but it's a, it's a half hour well spent um, and probably a nice follow-up to the lecture that I'll give. She gets into great detail about all the considerations and um, I think it's a, it's a very well done blog post. Anyway, enough about Michelle. Um, so the motivation here is the, the whole focus today is to talk about all of the considerations that come into play with RNA-seq. And it's really to, to, to counter the notion that RNA-seq is, is simple, right? I mean, we just, all we're doing is collecting RNA and counting things, and it should be easy to find, um, measure exactly what the average gene expression is in a, in a particular tissue type or in a particular condition. Um, and the reason we do this is to really understand how gene expression or gene regulation varies across cell types or tissues or genetic backgrounds or conditions. Um, but as I said, the whole focus of today is talking about why, why it isn't that simple. Um, I think this, this figure from a, a review a number of years ago summarizes the complexity. Um, it's broken up into three panels. I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but you can kind of scan it. And at the top, panel A is really about how are you designing your experiment? How are you gonna collect your RNA? What type of sequencing are you gonna do? Are you gonna do single end sequencing? Are you gonna do paired end sequencing? Are you gonna do PCR to amplify uh, the cDNA after you convert to cDNA? Are you going to, what sequencing technology are you going to use? Are you going to use spike ends to uh, have some cont uh, positive control to, to um, calibrate the expression that you see in the in genes that you haven't spiked in? How many replicates are you going to do, et cetera, et cetera? Panel B is getting into, well, how do you do sequence alignment? How do you quantify things? How do you model the noise that's in there? How are you going to go about doing differential expression? And then, you know, downstream of that, assuming you've identified what pipeline you want to follow or what strategy you want to follow for panels A and B, then you get into more sophisticated analyses like um, among all the genes that are, appear to be differentially expressed, what um, pathways are those genes enriched in? Um, do we know anything about quantitative trait loci associated with those genes? Um, what what sorts of technical or artifactual problems with the reference genome or the transcriptome or the sequence aligner that we used may lead falsely to some genes appearing to be differentially expressed when in fact they're not. Um, and then uh, lastly, I guess uh, a, a hot topic about five to 10 years ago and probably to some degree still is today um, was how do we actually quantify the expression. And we're going to talk a little bit about these metrics called RPKM, FPKM, and TPM today. All right, so point of this slide, there's lots of complexity because there's many moving parts in, in doing an RNA-seq. The molecular biology and the computational biology are inherently very complex, and there's lots of different uh, paths you could choose. So it's a bit of choose your own adventure in terms of what you're going to do. We talked about this last time. Um, the I won't go, so I won't go into detail again, but um, the, the molecular prep for RNA-seq is also quite complicated, actually. I mean, the fir first and foremost, we're not actually sequencing RNA, we're sequencing cDNA. Um, we have to get rid of contaminants and we got to re reverse transcribe. That has some bias. Some molecules are more likely to be reverse transcribed than others. That might affect the gene expression values that we see. We then have to ligate adapters. There's attrition when we do ligation steps. We have to size select attrition there, bias, and then we're sequencing ends of these molecules. So multiple steps introducing bias in, in the molecules that we end up observing. So in some ways, this is a concept, this is a notion of survivor bias where 
we're see we only get to study the molecules that survived all these steps prior to them coming off of the sequencing machine. And as a biologist, what we need to be thinking about is how do those steps maybe perturb the interpretation uh, that that we that we make with those data. We haven't formally talked about how sequence alignment works yet. That's coming up um, in a couple lectures. Um, actually, I might I might skip to that uh, on Thursday. Um, but generally, I think the concept is is quite simple. We have a sequence, a CD, short cDNA sequence. Alignment is figuring out what gene that molecule came from, and from a high level. RNA-seq is about aligning all the CDM, cDNA molecules that we get, or sequences that we get off the sequencing machine, aligning them to the transcriptome or the reference genome, and counting how many CDN, cDNA molecules were observed for a given exon or for a given isoform of a gene. And that count is a proxy for the average expression of that gene across all the cells that we threw into the mixture. So today's lecture is focusing on bulk RNA-seq, where we basically take a big scoop of cells, um, a conceptual scoop of cells, and fragment them, isolate RNA, convert to cDNA, and sequence it. So the counts that we get reflect the average, uh, we hope, reflect the average expression of each gene in that population of cells. And the first step, and getting that quantitative signal for expression is alignment to the reference genome and just counting things. And what we're going to talk about next is all the things that can confound a raw count or com the comparison of raw counts. Um, so as I said, the number of reads that align to some annotated gene is, is marked by this, this uh, indicator here is an estimate of how many transcripts are present in the sample. And the sample in this case is a, a collection of cells um, for that gene. Now there are problems. Um, the first one that I, I wanna touch on is something we haven't talked about much yet in the course, which is this, this bugger uh, called paralogy or more broadly homology. Um, so, Paralogs are gene copies within an individual species genome that are highly similar to one another. So let's imagine that um, you know, 10 million years ago, there's some gene in the human genome, gene A, and in some new individual, gene A, through ectopic recombination or some other process, was duplicated and placed somewhere else in the genome maybe through retrotransposition or non-homologous uh, combination, something. Now we've got gene copy A and gene copy A prime. After that duplication event, those two sequences are identical. And it turns out that gene duplication is, is, has, was rampant in most vertebrate genome lineages. And so there are many genes in the human genome and the chimp genome, mouse genome, that have other copies that are very similar to them. So let's imagine that gene A duplicates to gene A prime, and at that duplication event, they are identical. That individual that had that duplication event then goes on to have progeny. Those progeny have that duplication event, and so on and so forth. And say 100 generations later, now most genomes um, in the human population have this A copy and this A prime copy. Now over the generation, something called the molecular clock acts upon those two different gene copies, A and A prime. And the molecular clock is, I think of it as like Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs, where mutations over time arise in A and A prime and start to distinguish those two gene copies. The amount of time that passes subsequent to that duplication event makes those two gene copies diverge more and more and more. But if not that much time has passed, and not that much time in this context might be just a few million years, that's not much time for the molecular clock or mutation to distinguish those two copies. 
if the more similar those two copies are, the harder it is to take RNA molecules, convert them to cDNA, and unambiguously determine whether that cDNA molecule belonged to gene copy A or gene copy A prime. And therefore, this, this notion of paralogy um, basically complicates our interpretation of how highly or lowly expressed gene copy A and A prime are. Um, so that simple example of A and A prime um, scales to, to the whole genome. We have, there's lots of genes in the human genome that have many, not just one copy, but sometimes many copies. And for those genes, it's very difficult to, to quantify expression because the cDNA sequences or reads, as I often call them, don't always map uniquely or unambiguously to the reference genome. So that's one problem for counting is paralogy. Um, the other problem is reads that span multiple exons. Um, there, it's not necessarily a problem, but RNA sequence alignment tools have to recognize the fact that, you know, part of the cDNA molecule may align to one exon and part of the cDNA molecule might align to a different exon because the cDNA, remember, is the result of mRNA splicing, introns have been removed, but then when you go to align that cDNA molecule back to the reference genome, introns are there, so you get these split alignments. And then I think the, probably the most um, problematic aspect of just pure counts of reads is sampling error. And what I mean by that is there's just all these molecular biases um, cDNA conversion, uh, ligating adapters, size selection, that can make the number of observed cDNA molecules differ from the truth. And usually, you, 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 I think the attrition makes you think that the counts might be lower. The, the resulting counts that you see might always be lower than um, the truth. But there are cases where it can be higher, for, for instance, paralogy. Perhaps some of the, all the, there's a, a and A prime, but maybe for some, maybe the sequence aligner gets confused and aligns all the cDNA molecules to A prime. So it essentially gets double the counts that it should and A gets nothing. So there's all sorts of problems like that and an in, in infinite number of shades of gray in between those, those synchronic extremes. Okay, so let's, let's just walk through um, a hypothetical example. Um, we, let's imagine we have collected RNA-seq data. So we've isolated an RNA, we've con converted to cDNA, and we paid for sequencing on the Illumina sequencer for both a control condition and an experimental condition. And let's say we're fortunate and we've got a very simple model organism which just has five genes. Obviously, this is hypothetical. And these are the raw results we get. Um, so essentially what we've run a tool, a common tool for this is uh, something called feature counts. This is something that you would run on the Unix command line. And you would say, hey, feature counts, count the number of cDNA molecules aligned to each of these five genes in my control and experimental condition. And these two conditions, those, those counts, or the alignments that this tool is going to count are going to come from something called a BAM file, which we'll talk about later, which is the result of essentially aligning those cDNA molecules to a reference genome. All right, and so what it observed is the following. So the same number of counts for gene A in the control versus experimental. And then you can see that for these other genes, it looks like there's much, um, much higher sequencing counts in the experimental condition. Um, so, you know, looking at this, if this, if we got a little spreadsheet or a data frame, we were just taking a quick look at this, um, you know, we're lucky we just have five genes, so we can just basically look at it and do the analysis by eye. We might say, wow, in the, in the control condition, it seems like gene E is three times more expressed than gene D. And that might surprise us because you know we, we know something about gene E and we wouldn't have expected it to be 
more expressed than gene D in the control condition. Um, but you know why 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 might that might why might that observation be flawed? And then another question is, um, it seems like the experimental condition, B, genes B, C, D, and E are markedly higher expressed than in the control condition. So that may be true, but what we need to think about is why also that may not actually be the truth. So what, what are some reasons why uh, these observations, these conclusions, I guess, might be flawed? We don't know the size of the genes relative to each other. So gene E could be much larger than gene D. Exactly. For instance, if gene three, gene E were three times larger than gene e, D, I'll get that right eventually. Um, yeah, I mean, this is exactly what we'd expect to see because it's essentially, it, it occupies, it has three times greater chance of actually sampling a cDNA molecule because it's larger. Remember, we have to fragment the molecules and all this kind of thing. Okay, so that, that explains this um, some concern with this um, observation on the left. What about the observation on the right? Anyone have any guesses as to why we, we might be jumping the gun a little bit and assuming that the experimental condition, all the genes are, or most of the genes are three times higher expressed than in the control? Total RNA levels. Hmm? Total RNA levels. Total RNA levels. Yes. Can you elaborate on that a little bit bit more? Do you yeah. mean so if you're sequencing like the mRNA, then there's more total mRNA in the experimental condition than there are in the controls. But not because of true biology, but because of like yeah. the way that's are you, what you're are you looking yeah. for a biological reason? Yeah, right. Okay. So that's that's right. So um Kevin's hypothesis is that maybe the fact that we're seeing three times more counts in the experimental condition is essentially the yield of RNA that we got out of the experimental condition was much greater than the yield we got out of the control, but the actual biological expression is equivalent. That's one explanation. I mean, you can also have um, increased transcription rate too. Yes, you can have condition can you, So that, that what I would argue is a biological reason. Um, and so that's that's sort of the signal we'd be looking for. That's absolutely true. Um, the the RNA yield would differences in just RNA yield because of you know um, greater attrition in the control condition versus the experimental condition would be more of a technical source of this difference. And then the last one is is really dead simple. Um, the control was done two years ago when there wasn't much money in the lab. And this one was done this year when there's a big grant and we sequenced this one, the experimental condition with 150 million reads and the control condition with 50 million reads. So there's three times as much data. The same, you could imagine the same number of RNA, RNA molecules were available in each condition, but we actually just sequenced more uh, on the, um, a greater proportion or three times more molecules in the experimental condition. All right, so thank you for walking through the thought experiment here. Um, so exactly, so would you reach the same conclusion if you knew that the control experiment used 10 million reads versus 30 million reads or 50 million reads versus 150 million reads? I think intuitively the answer is no. Um, so this introduces the concept of normalization, or uh, maybe another way of doing it is standardizing the counts or normalizing the counts. And what's meant by that is you need, th this is currently an apples to oranges comparison. These raw counts are not controlled for the fact that, you know, there's three times as much data in one condition versus the other. So in order for this to be a Apples to apples, or uh, if you like oranges more and oranges to oranges comparison, we have to recalibrate those counts um, to to take a, take into account that there's just more overall data in the experimental condition. Okay, so um, there are many possible explanations for this. Um, so you could say that 
right? There are three times as many transcripts expressed for gene E than D. That's the biological explanation. Um, I think it was maybe Jordan who came up with option two here. Gene E is three times as long as gene D. And then you could say, well, gene D, it's also possible that gene D and E are actually the same length and produce the same number of transcripts, but gene D has a close paralog, D prime, uh, to follow the analogy earlier, that has acted as a sponge. It sucked away two thirds of the alignments that belong truly to D, but went to D prime. So you could see this depletion of the counts for gene D owing to virology. And I know that probably seems like a corner case, but it's actually not. Um, most of the gene, there's a couple papers, I don't know if I mentioned it in this lecture or late, another lecture, but there's a couple of papers about, um, it's essentially like riffing on the wonderful movie, Usual Suspects. I think it's called like the usual suspects for genes. And it's about, um, the genes that commonly arise as differentially expressed or in exome sequencing as, as genes having like uh, weird genetic variants in them. And basically the thesis of the, the, those papers, there's one in particular, is basically saying, well, the main reason for this is that these genes are usual suspects because they're part of large gene families where there's a high degree of paralogy, which just totally messes up the sequence aligners because the sequence aligners are not, they don't, they don't, they have no idea about which sequence in the reference genome is, is a paralog of, you know, D and D prime and A and A prime. They just know roughly similarity uh, uh, among DNA sequences in the, in the reference genome. Okay, so the long story short is it's complicated. We can't, we can't really just look at counts and make direct inferences about the underlying biology. Okay, so this gets into our, the first normalization approach that I'd like to cover, um, which is reads uh, per kilobase of exon model per million reads. So that's a, that's a, uh, like a double rate here, a very complicated concept, RPKM. And then um, the analog to it is FPKM, which is fragments instead of reads. So the difference here is if you're doing a paired end sequence, whether you count each end as a read versus the entire molecule as a fragment, they're, they're, they're very closely related. So let's, I'm not going to try to distinguish them here. What I'm going to walk through is what the motivation for this normalization technique is. Okay, so when you do this type of normalization, you need an extra piece of information. I think it was Jordan brought up. We need to know the size of the genome. So when you, when you run, um, I don't think, I think maybe feature counts does this now, but some of the RNA-seq packages in R, which will, you know, take the raw counts and do some of this normalization for you. The, the file that it typically needs is essentially like a GTF file, well, literally a GTF file that you used a couple of homeworks ago. And it, from that GTF file, it, it tracks each gene name and figures out the counts for that gene in each of the conditions. And then it says, well, what's the total size of this gene? And it uses that to um, essentially normalize the counts by size. So in this case, we've basically got a very small gene all the way to the largest gene here. So what we end up doing is um, we want to first, the first step in this process is to normalize the counts, not by the gene size yet, by but by the total amount of sequences that were available in or observed in each experiment. So in the control, if we knew, we, one of the things we need to know is the total number of alignments or sequences in the, in the file. Let's imagine we got 20 million reads for the control experiment and 40 million reads for the, uh, the experimental. Then we can just convert that to millions of reads. That's this per millions of reads. That's the M in RPKM or um, the M in FPKM. So this gets converted to a 20 and a 40. 
and then we divide each of those counts by the number of millions. So then now we have reads per million in the control and reads per million in the condition. That's what RPM stands for. Um, so you can just to flip back 27 uh, divided by 20 is 1.34, 90 divided by 20 is 4.5 and so on and so forth. So that's step one. So we're normalizing the counts by the total amount of data. So it's essentially like what's the fraction of data that, that this represents, but normalized to millions. Then what we do is we take these RPM measures and we normalize those by the gene length. So this makes, the first step was to make all the counts relative to the total. Now we're doing an additional step to take these, the first step of normalization and, and normalizing it to the size of the gene to account for uh, what Jordan wants to plot. So um, we, Take so this is the sorry, this is the per kilobase of exon model piece of the RPKM. So essentially, what we do is we convert these counts by the number of kilobases that the gene actually uh, uh, represents in coding space, the exons of the gene. How many kilobases in total do the exons in that gene represent? Um, so at the end of the day, um, oops, sorry. So when we divide 1.34 by one kilobase, it remains 1.34, let me go back. When we divide 4.5 by now two kilobases, so 4.5 divided by two, we get 2.25. Uh, and I'll just jump to this one. And then 155 is divided by 40 because there's 40 kilobases of coding sequence in this gene. So that gets normalized. Now, what we can see is whereas the RPM values are um, range from one to 155, once we've normalized for both total count and gene length, these, these values are much closer to one another. So it still looks like there's a little bit more expression in gene E than say uh, gene D or gene A, but the order of magnitude is much smaller post-normalization than it was pre-normalization, okay? Um, at this point, so, you know, 10 years ago, when I looked at my first RNA-seq experiment, this was kind of stuff that people were rolling their own methods and labs and trying to figure out how best to do this. I introduced this mainly so you understand the concept of, A, what these complicated acronyms actually are doing. And this is a mouthful to, to even to think through. Um, and it's, so you so you basically understand what is happening in packages like edge R and DEC, which are trying to do this type of stuff when when modeling the technical and biological variants in your gene expression um, data sets or NAC data sets there. This is happening behind the scenes, but it's important to understand what's actually happening behind the scenes. OK, so. Um, this allows us RPKM and FPKM, it's analog, it allows us to compare the relative expression of genes within a condition. Because we've normalized by both counts within the condition and gene size, now we can figure out, we can ask the question, well, what's the, in this condition or in this mouse or whatever, what is the least expressed gene? What is the most expressed gene? What's the rank ordering of expression in this condition because we've accounted for gene size. Okay, so this allows us to say, oh, well, looks like in the experimental condition, gene B was the most expressed and, and then gene E, uh, I'm sorry, in the control condition, gene E was the most expressed. So in a nutshell, RPKM is, is really well suited for within sample comparisons or ranking of gene expression, which genes are in the top 10% of expression in a particular condition. What we're going to talk about next is another metric for normalization called TPM, which is arguably a better uh, normalization strategy for comparing expression across conditions, which is, I think, the more common type of analysis that, that's done. Um, so TPM um, 
from a really high level, it doesn't do the gene size correction because if your if your goal is to compare the expression of gene E in the two conditions, the really all we need to do is normalize the counts by the total number of reads available in the two experiments because 40 KB for gene E is a constant. It's, it's just a, it, it, it factors out when you compare the relative expression between the two different conditions. So that's basically the tweak in TPM is that you really don't need to do the gene size correction if you're doing across sample comparisons of the same gene. Um, so there's a uh, number of packages out there for doing this type of work. I can't claim to be um, an expert in, in the relative value of these different packages. There's DEC, there's EDGEAR, there's LIMA. I do know that probably the most widely used packages for RNA-seq are DEC and EDGEAR. Um, but I, this field moves so quickly and there's so many tweaks to the underlying statistical models. I think if you're going to do this type of analysis, you know, you'd want to read recent papers to see what strategies they're using. Um, but these are sort of the, these three are the, um, the main players in this area to identify differentially expressed genes between samples. Okay, so what we're going to what we're going to now move into is uh, revisiting uh, a slide that I, a version of the slide that I talked about last time, which is the need for replicates. And the main thing that I want to emphasize, and we talked about this last time, is that technical replicates, where you take the same biological sample and make libraries multiple times um, following the same technical procedure, you know, library prep and sequencing. These comparing the expression uh, or the variance in expression among these technical replicates, say for the experimental condition, really allows you to understand the, tech, the, tech, the degree of technical variation in your experiment that, is, that, that arises even before biological variation. So understanding the technical variation within one condition conceptually empowers you to understand effectively how much you trust the observed biological variation between the inferred biological variation between conditions. Okay. And um, Michelle's blog post spends probably four or five paragraphs on this topic alone, but from a high level, that's, that's what we're going after here. We'll talk more about that as we move on. All right, so now what are the sources of variation? Um, we, last time we talked about Poisson variation um, to set, set up this, this first type of variation. So Poisson um, technical variation is really reflecting the fact that when, let's say the, the mean, the true mean of the number of RNAs that we would, if we, if we could truly go in and sample 1,000 different cells, and for each cell, we got to count that we knew that we could absolutely measure the truth. How many RNA molecules are in that, are in that cell? We would come up with a mean across all those thousand cells, and that mean could be modeled by a Poisson, or, or the, the variance about that mean could be modeled by a Poisson process. So that mean would be the lambda. Let's say the mean that we observed across all thousand cells is say eight RNA molecules for that, from that gene. Then we, if we knew that, then we could predict the probability in the future, if we got to sample cells again, of seeing two reads or five reads or 16 reads simply by this Poisson process. That mean gives us a distribution that looks like these two, like these plots here. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but essentially it's, it's just that sampling is, it's random sampling. You know, at a given moment in a cell, the number of RNA molecules that, that you observed is, is really stochastic. It's not, it's not uniform across cells. Okay, so let's imagine that we have three different genes, A, B, and C. And what we're looking at here is um, observed 
um, differences in the mean expression of the mean recounts between a control condition and an experimental condition. And these plots are simulated um, based upon, based upon a, a Poisson process. So I can just look at this blue one and I can tell you that the, the lambda for this blue gene or the, the control condition for gene A was one because the probability of zero molecules and the probability of one is the same. And it looks to me like the mean here for red is two. So the mean in the control in the experimental differ by a factor of two. Gene A, the mean expression across cells is say two versus the mean for one. So that's a twofold difference in expression. But the point here is that the variance, when the mean is so low, the variance between these two distributions overlaps so much that you could never really trust an observed difference in the expression between the two conditions for gene A. It's, it's just too noisy. It's low. So this gets up the notion, you've probably heard this before, that you, it's very difficult to trust or interpret low count data. And that really comes from the fact that when the, the average count is low the, for both conditions, Poisson variance um, is, is too, the, the, the degree of overlap between those distributions is too much to make any real inferences. Now, in contrast, the mean for experimental here is 20. The mean for control is 10. And you can see that the, the means here are much uh, better separated than the means for gene A. There is still overlap in the tails, but you know, if we see uh, you know, 20, 25 reads versus 10 reads, we can believe that differential expression, potential differential expression between experimental control more because we know that the mean um, is, is higher in both cases. So the, the, the reality of the Poisson distribution is that the variance and the mean um, track together. So as, as mean increases, the variance increases, but the means when there, when there is a difference, a twofold difference in the means between conditions, the degree of overlap of the variance of these two distribution decreases. While variance tracks with the mean, the difference in variances between the conditions um, becomes greater and greater. So to really ram that point home, for GNC, the mean is 200 for experimental, 100 for control. So in this case, we can be very trusting of the observed difference, that twofold difference in expression, mean expression for experimental versus control because we have high counts. And so the, even though the variance tracks with the mean for these two different distributions, the separation between the distributions is much greater. Um, so long story short, this is just a simulation that Michelle did uh, as part of her grad work to show effectively that you need higher counts or better estimate of the mean to really trust apparent differential expression between conditions. Okay, so let's, this is another simulation from her uh, thesis and uh, that also made it into her blog post. This is another experiment. Um, what she did was she simulated two theoretical technical replicates. Replicate one on the x-axis, replicate two on the y-axis. And the values on the, on the x and y-axis are the, um, the mean, uh, the lambda, essentially. And so if, if the, let's take a given gene, if the lambda is, um, say, five, there are many cases where the actual random variable that you'll get out for that gene with a lambda of five might be seven in one, in one replicate and two in another replicate. So that looks like a three-fold, three-and-a-half-fold difference in expression, but based upon the previous slide, we shouldn't be too trusting of that apparent differential expression. So what you're seeing here down at the low end of this plot 
when the lambda is very low, you get lots of apparent genes where the differential expression seems to be quite high. Whereas we would expect, since these are technical replicates, for everything to be right on the diagonal. You know, we would kind of naively expect the exact same count in replicate one versus replicate two. But when it's a lowly expressed gene, therefore the lambda uh, in this simulation is small, then we artifactually get apparent differential expression for many genes because it's, you know, the, the variance in those random variables is so large as in, as in this plot or even this plot. In contrast, as the mean expression gets out close to say 100 or even 1,000 or 10,000, the, the replicates start to look really, really similar to one another um, because the variance relative to the mean is, is um, somewhat smaller between the replicates. So we have less, less noise from those random variables. Um, the whole point of this plot, though, is to demonstrate that whenever you're doing replicates, there is inherent noise. It's, this is sampling noise. For low, and that sampling noise is amplified when the gene expression for a given gene is, is low and is less, less of a problem when the gene is highly expressed. Okay, so red, this red plot is technical noise from Poisson sampling problems alone. Nothing else, just the sampling noise coming from looking at one cell and another cell and another cell and just asking how many molecules are there. So stochasticity among uh, the different, different cells. Not only do we have to deal with Poisson technical noise, but we also have to um, handle another source of variation, which is non-Poisson technical variation. And, and this is really, I think this, this summarizes it nicely. I'm quoting uh, Michelle directly here. Non-Poisson technical variance is measurement imprecision. Um, and remember, we harken back to the accuracy and precision lecture. So imprecision. So we're not, we don't get consistent estimates. You know, throwing, we're throwing darts all over the place. We get inconsistent measurements in RNAC um, that that really arise from um, things like down here at the bottom. PCR amplification biases or errors, um, problems with, um, you know, variance in the efficacy of adapter ligation, um, problems with a flow cell. Uh, you might be sequencing, um, you know, your control condition might have been sequenced in March, and that was a time when our sequencing core had really good flow cells from Illumina, and then in April they got a bum batch of of flow cells that just weren't manufactured with the same degree of uh, fidelity, for lack of a better term. Um, and so therefore, there's, it's just a noisier experiment. So what this plot is showing is that these blue points, um, what I'm trying to show is those blue points, if you can see it, it are, go above and beyond the range of variance for the red points. So that this technical variance that arises from non-Poisson sampling problems, so PCR and bad flow cells, exacerbates the technical variance even above and beyond Poisson. So, you know, for instance, let's just pick one gene and think through it. In, in technical replicate one, uh, this looks like maybe a two or three, two thousand twenty five hundred um, read counts, but in law in the second replicate it had ten thousand read counts, and that could be um, this this the cDNA molecules in replicate two went through um, more rounds of PCR, or the PCR was more effective for those molecules in replicate two versus replicate one. Or conversely, it could be that replica, replicate one is artifactually lower than the truth because uh, maybe, maybe the adapters didn't ligate as well um, to the, the cDNA molecules from this gene that repre represented by this blue point um, in replicate one. So there's all sorts of stuff that you just have to scratch your head about. 
the main thesis of this lecture I'm thinking about RNA seq is that you can you can reduce that uncertainty by having lots of replicates. When you start, when the, you know there's lots of sources of error, um, if you get multiple replicates or multiple samples, you start to converge on a better estimate of of the truth. Right. So here's here's the red and blue points together on the same plot. So the red points are the Poisson only technical variants. The blue points, um, which are modeled by the technical replicates, just to, to bring this together, blue points tell us kind of the inherent noise, the red and the blue tell us the inherent noise in our system. And then the green points are comparing biological replicates. So condition one versus condition two. Um, and so really the point of this plot is we only can be trusting of observed differences uh, biological differences that are above and beyond the noise predicted by the blue and the red points. So it's these green points. There's lots of green points underneath the red and blue ones, but those ones we can't trust because the, the degree of variance is, is exactly what you'd, be pre you'd predict by Poisson or technical variation. It's solely those red points that are outside of that noise cloud that you can start to, to trust. Again, I guess the thing I want to emphasize is this is the type of thought and mathematical modeling that's happening in packages like DEC and, and Edge R. But it's important that you understand what they're actually doing because sometimes you you might need to tweak the way the analysis is done in those in those packages or or think about um, you know how to model better model the technical uh, variation that's in, in the system. Now. What we're going to move on to in just a second is well how do you how do you shrink that technical variation so that you have better power to detect true biological variation and that's where replicates come in if we have this is just for two replicates but imagine we had it's harder to show on a two on a scatter plot like this but if we had three replicates or four replicates what happens is we start to shrink um, the technical variation. We start to converge on a tr better estimate of the mean expression for a given gene across replicates. And when we have a better estimate of that mean with less variance, if you imagine a, a distribution, if that variance shrinks, then we can more be more trusting of outlier points. But if the variance is very wide from just a couple of replicates, we can't be trusting of outliers. Okay. Um, I'm about to jump into the last few slides, which become a little more technical. I just want to ask at this point if, if there's any questions or if, if everyone's with me. Any questions at this point? Happy to pause. All right, I will pause for coffee and move on. Okay, so here, here's, I, I think this is probably the most informative slide um, or figure from Michelle's blog post and from her thesis which is this, this, I think, uh, conceptual measure or conceptual notion of measurement uncertainty. So what we're shooting for is very little measurement uncertainty. So measurement un uncertainty here is when we have um, an observed count of cDNA molecules that's been normalized with FPTKM or FPKM or TPM, we want to we want to have some confidence that that is like a, a fairly certain measure, low uncertainty. Now, what this is showing is when the mean read count for a gene is very low, so at the left side, um, there's a huge amount of measurement uncertainty. And what this is showing is that the bulk of that measurement uncertainty is coming from Poisson variation when the gene expression is very low. And that's because low counts, it's just very random. There's a lot of variance. You know, if the mean is three, we could get zero counts. We could get one, two, three, four, five, all with fairly comparable probabilities. Um, when the read counts are low, we also have 
um, non-Poisson technical variation, but you can think of that as a constant in the system. If the technical variation is like, it's fairly consistent from experiment to experiment, there's always adapter ligation, there's always PCR. So the way she's depicting this is conceptually right. I mean, it's not quite a flat line, but it's, it's almost a constant source of noise in the system. And then there's biological plus technical uncertainty. So there's sort of the, the biological the thing that we're going after, you know, true differences in gene expression. Um, and the whole point of this plot is that as the mean read count per gene increases, the relative contribution of Poisson technical variation um, and technical and non-Poisson technical variation um, diminishes. And so with, with this, this is essentially a power analysis showing that when you get out to about a mean of 40 aligned cDNA molecules per gene, the bulk of the variance that you observe um, is driven by biology and not by technical sources. And when you, and so this is, this sort of, this is a simulation, it's a thought experiment that, that motivates the need to get more read counts per gene. And hopefully that makes some sense. Essentially, like we can't trust differential expression between two and one, you know, two counts in one condition, one in the other. We can trust it a bit more when we see 20 versus 10. And we can be pretty trusting of it when it's 40 versus 20. And if you're familiar with the central limit theorem, this kind of follows rule of thumb for central limit theorem is when you get to about uh, a mean of 30, um, things start to, you start to be able to trust the uh, differences that you observe. Okay, so if you, if you buy into this, I hope you do, um, the, 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 the corollary is, well, then how do we go about decreasing that uncertainty um, by getting a higher mean count? So there's, there's one, one strategy, which is just to, let's say we did 20 million reads for a given RNA-seq library. Well, let's just take the same library and, and sequence another 20 million reads. So we double it. Um, <clears throat> so we could do that. Uh, that would take it from, let's say this is the first experiment where we had, you know, for replicate one, 12 and 12, replicate two, 14 and 41, 19 and seven, then up, we're like, oh, let's just take those same libraries and double, double the reads. This is a theoretical doubling. It's not quite double in every case, but we shot for doubling. And now we get a difference of 38 versus 15. And based upon the plots for replicate three, based upon the plots I showed you before, we should start to trust that difference more than say 19 versus seven. So that's one strategy. Another strategy is to not just double sequence more reads from the same library, you could actually do um, more replicates. So what, what I'm showing here is the difference between two replicates, three replicates, four replicates, and five replicates. And what we're measuring is our estimate of the mean expression. And this is directly the, the central limit theorem, which we'll talk about formally later. But the whole idea behind the central limit theorem is as you collect more and more samples, you never get to measure the truth directly. But if you take little sample, random samples, um, and take multiple random samples, you start to converge on a better estimate of the mean. And the, so in each of these, in each of these cases, the mean is pretty darn similar to one another. The mean for one condition in green, the mean for another condition in uh, magenta, I guess. Um, it's pretty much the same. Um, but as you increase the number of replicates, that variance about the mean shrinks. And so the separation between these um, two conditions or estimate um, increases. So therefore, you know, whereas if we had a point right here on the a gene that had an, uh, an estimate roughly here, we couldn't, we wouldn't be too trusting of the differential expression between this condition and this condition because so much of the other condition overlaps that, that mean expression value. 
with the same position on this plot, we're much more confident because the, we have a, better, a, a much better estimate of the mean and the variance across replicates. So um, this is getting at the, the main take home point of Michelle's blog post um, and that essentially rep, the more replicates that you can do to get a better estimate of the mean expression and variance in expression, the better off you'll be. So in this case, here's another um, plot showing measurement uncertainty um, and looking at the original read count on the x-axis. So let's say the original experiment just had two replicates and you can see that the measurement uncertainty is, is relatively high. The red line, the red dashed line and the blue points are two different alternative scenarios to improve upon this measurement uncertainty for the original experiment. One scenario is to do four replicates um, with the same read depth, or two replicates just doubling the read depth. So you basically use the same library and just get more sequences. And what you can see is there's really not much of a difference here. Um, the, in either scenario, you do reduce the measurement uncertainty compared to the original experiment, but there's no difference in that reduction between those two scenarios. Four replicates, same read depth versus two replicates read depth doubled. In contrast, um, if, I'm sorry, sorry, I apologize. This is the outcome if you only consider Poisson variance. However, we know that there's technical variance. So if we account for technical variance as well, what we see is that, as I just said, tried to say before, when we include more replicates, four replicates, same read depth versus two replicates and doubling the reads, we get a, a more dramatic reduction in the measurement uncertainty. So essentially the take home here is when you're considering both Poisson and technical, um, non-Poisson technical variants, more replicates, is better than just simply increasing the total number of reads. And the, main, the intuition behind that is really this, that the uncertainty about the mean, the variance about the mean gene expression reduces with more replicates, allowing you to have better confidence in apparent differences in gene expression between one condition versus the other. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about, briefly talk about multiple testing in the last few minutes. Uh, any questions about the previous slides? If you forget, if you remember nothing from this lecture, um, except for one thing, remember that more replicates is better because it reduces the technical variation in your system, allows you to find differential expression of greater confidence. The p-values associated with those differential expression values will be more significant. What we're going to transition into now is this notion of well, you're looking for significant p-values when comparing the expression between two conditions. So that's confident differential expression. But there's this problem of multiple testing. Essentially, you're doing that experiment for, well, let's just change this here, not 30,000 genes. Let's just call it 20,000 genes because that's a better estimate now. Um, so if we're testing 20,000 genes. Oh, I gotta update my math now though, that's a bummer. Um, we expect to see, um, if we're doing a test for 20,000 genes and we set our significance cutoff at P less than or equal to 0 0.05, we're only gonna consider genes that, have a, that, that meet that p-value threshold. Then we expect by definition that 5% of our 20,000 genes will actually be below that um, threshold just by random chance. So if you set um, your threshold at, at P less than 0 0.05, then, um, and, and we see 1,000 genes that come out, then either, since that's exactly what you'd expect given the number of tests that you've done and the threshold you set, then, then, the, then it's, the, the fact is that then there's either no genes that are differenti differentially expressed between the two conditions, 
or your experiment is underpowered to detect any real expression differences. Now, if you saw 1500 genes that survive that threshold of 0 0.05, then your intuition is, well, it seems like there's about 500 genes that may be truly differentially expressed. A thousand of them we expect by random chance. But the problem is you don't know a priori which 500 are the good ones. So it's, it, it's this problem of, you know, your, your signal, 1500, is very close to the noise that you expect because of multiple testing problems. Um, and so what packages, packages like DEC and EdgeR recognize this, that you're, you know, you're giving, it, giving it a big data frame of all these genes and counts, and it's, it's um, looking at technical variation and Poisson and non-Poisson technical variation and trying to arrive at a p-value for differential expression, modeling all those things for you. Um, but what you also want to do is try to, re try to report a false discovery rate as well as a p-value. And the false discovery rate is the expected proportion of false positives among all the significant results. So in the previous example, since we expect 1,000 genes to survive p0.05, and we see 1,000, then our false discovery rate is 100%. We expect that every one of those is a false positive. So what we're really trying to strive for typically is a false discovery rate of 10% or lower. So that, that even though we don't know, because, and this gets at this conundrum of, let's say we had 2000 genes that survived that 0 0.05 threshold. That means that we have a false discovery rate of 50% because we expect 1000 to survive that threshold by chance. So we're trying to get um, a false discovery rate of less than 10% so that we, we can make, you know, the closing argument in our results section, which says, well, yeah, we don't know what all, all of these, which of these are, are true, but we, based upon the p-value threshold, we predict that only 10% of these false positives um, are, 10% uh, of these genes are actually false positives because of the null expectation of the number of genes that we would expect to survive that threshold. Um, and so, you know, trying to get a false discovery rate that low is driven by um, essentially having technical replicates that help us model not only the, the mean um, expression value, but also the variance in expression value, which allows us to have more confident p-values for um, you know, the truly biologically differentially expressed uh, genes in our experiment. Okay, um, so the, the point of today's lecture in summary is to think through the sources of variance or variation in an RNA-seq experiment, especially in the context of differential expression, um, and really for you to have some comfort with what's happening behind the scenes. If you're doing RNA-seq, I know some of you are, probably many of you. This is the stuff that these packages handle for you. Um, but I would encourage you to, if you are doing this work, to read um, Michelle's blog post. Um, and there's other, there's other papers from that group and more recent papers from people like Mike Love um, and Rafa Irizarry and others, which really just talk about um, the importance of replicates and the importance of understanding the, the sources of technical variation in your system so that we can make true biological inferences from our differential expression experiments. Um, and I think, you know, the, the thing that some of these, these articles and blog posts talk about is, you know, when you, when you read a paper which talks about you know, finding all the differentially expressed genes with two replicates, you should go in with, a, with some some healthy skepticism about, you know, what is the false discovery rate in that system? And if they're throwing all those genes into a pathway analysis, how much do you really trust that the pathways that come, that turn out to be lit up between those two different conditions? Um, so you should be skeptical.
All right. Um, so that that's all I have for today. If we but we've got a few minutes. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. If not, we'll see you on Thursday. Are there any questions at this point? Okay. Well, thanks for your time, and I will see you on Thursday. Um, Dr. Quinlan. Yeah. Do you happen to have a few minutes? I'm working with a GTF file, and I just have a somewhat simple question that I think you could help me solve. Sure. Yeah, I do. Um, cool. So I'm trying to run this pipeline for single cell RNA seq data um, to do RNA velocity, and basically I'm having a an error with a GTF file I'm trying to use, which is a custom genome that has Cas9 and GFP as well as the rest of the mouse genome. Uh -huh. um, so I have the GTF file that my bioinformatician made, but the program that I'm running has a problem because after the um, exon number in the GTF file, then the actual exon number is in quotations and like it doesn't want it to be in quotations. And so I've been trying to like just get rid of the quotations after or of all of the exon number. Okay. Uh, and it should be simple, but I'm struggling. Have you have you tested have you tested that in fact the software works with a toy file that doesn't have quotes around the exon number? Yeah. And it does. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you basically and it and it just complains about quotes around the exon number, not quotes about around other stuff. It says uh, there is no exon number, so it like won't even recognize it because it's in quotes. Okay. Could you send me an, an email, like a, just a few lines from that file? Yeah, for sure. And I can I can help you uh, figure that out. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Take care. You too. Bye, everyone. <laughs>